This talk is on the Anchor Verifier for Concurrent Software by Stephen Friend and myself, Cormac Flanagan. The story behind this work starts a decade ago when Steve and I developed the Fast Track Dynamic Race Detector. Now, Fast Track is itself a sophisticated concurrent algorithm. So, a couple of years ago, Steve and I worked with James Wilcox and a variant called Verified FT with a pencil and paper proof of correctness. Verified FT is a pretty small algorithm, but to maximize performance, it's got a very complicated synchronization discipline. Next, we took Civil, which is a state of the art verifier for concurrent software, and applied it to our algorithm. Now, Civil stands for Concurrent Intermediate Verification Language. So its source language is not executable and it's a lower level language than one would normally work with. So we found the Civil version of our algorithm had a bunch of low level detail and boilerplate that made the verification and iterative debugging process much harder and more complicated than we felt it needed to be. This experience motivated our development of the Anchor Concurrent Verifier, which facilitates the verification of concurrent algorithms. In this case, reducing the amount of code and specifications that we needed to write by a factor of two. As an overview, Anchor combines traditional techniques for sequential reasoning, such as weakest preconditions, with reduction to reason about thread interference, and a new kind of synchronization specifications that are concise, intuitive, and expressive. Anchor is based on automatic SMT solving and includes a compiler to generate executable code directly from verified Anchor source code. As an example of Anchor's reasoning, here we have a simple class counter with an integer field n, together with a code fragment in a synchronized block that increments n, and the red ellipses denote potential interleaved steps of other threads. This moves as clause documents the synchronization discipline for the field n. It simply says if a thread holds the protecting lock this, then accesses to n are permitted, and are both movers denoted b, meaning they commute in both directions, both forward and backward, across interleaved steps of other threads. Conversely, accesses to n without holding the lock are an error, denoted e. Anchor uses this moves as synchronization specification to perform reduction-based reasoning as follows. This read of n is a both mover, since the lock is held, and the other thread can't hold the lock and so can't access that field. So this both mover read commutes forward in the trace without changing program behavior. Similarly, the right is also a both mover. And if we look at this acquire, once the thread holds the lock, the other red threads can't mess with the lock, so acquires are always right movers, and conversely, releases are always left movers. So we get an equivalent serial trace where this code fragment executes serially without interleaved steps from other threads. And we can apply this commuting argument called reduction to any code fragment that satisfies the following pattern. First, a bunch of right movers are both movers. At most, one non-mover operation, denoted n, that doesn't need to commute across steps of concurrent threads. And then a bunch of left movers are both movers. And whenever this reduction pattern applies, Anchor can safely use sequential reasoning, since all interleaved steps of other threads can be commuted out. Anchor's reduction-based reasoning is all driven by these moves as synchronization specifications, which turn out to scale very nicely from simple synchronization disciplines like this one to much more complex synchronization disciplines like in Fast Track, simply by allowing nested conditionals and a rich language of conditional predicates. I'm now going to demonstrate Anchor by implementing a concurrent stack data structure. The input language for Anchor is a subset of Java, so I'll begin by creating a class stack with a single field head whose type is node and whose moves as annotation indicates that the field is protected by the enclosing stack objects lock. We'll use node objects to form a list. So if we look at the definition of node, we'll find two fields, item and next, that have the following moves as specification. It indicates that all accesses to the object uh, when it's local are both movers, but as soon as the object becomes shared, uh, the fields are read only. That is, they're both movers for read and error for writes. With those definitions, I can write a push method that acquires the lock, 
creates a new node object, inserts it at the head, and then releases the lock. The body of this method is reducible to a single atomic block, which Anchor verifies. We have a right mover acquire, both mover reads and writes, and then a left mover lock release. I can also add a specification to this method describing that it updates head to store a pointer to the old head, and uh, the new head also stores the new item. Again, I can verify this code in Anchor. I'm also going to send my class to have a pop method. Uh, this method is going to busy wait until there is an item, of, item available. So we'll acquire the lock, and while the head is null, we'll enter a loop that releases the lock and then reacquires it. After the loop, I can retrieve the top item and update head appropriately. I've also, have, as you may have noticed, put an invariant uh, that we hold the lock at the top of every loop iteration to aid in the verification process. Okay, if we were to try to verify this code in Anchor, it would complain because the body of the method is not a single reducible sequence of operations. For example, if I uh, perform one up, if I perform one loop iteration before continuing, we'd have an execution that looks like this. And our reduction, our reduction argument does not allow us to commute those steps in the middle from other threads out from uh, this execution. Uh, to identify places like this where we actually expect to observe the behavior of other threads, we add yield annotations to the source code. And Anchor verifies that every execution of a method is a sequence of reducible blocks separated by yields. One interesting technical detail of Anchor is that it uses the moves as annotations on fields to model how other threads might change them at yield points. All atomic blocks executed during a call to pop are side effect free and essentially no ops except for the last atomic block. As such, I can, follow, I can add the following annotations to capture the behavior of that one publicly visible atomic block. I'd also like to take a moment to show you a second version of the stack that uses optimistic concurrency control instead of locks. I don't have time to go over all of the details, but Anchor supports an atomic compare and swap operation and can effectively verify algorithms using those operations, even when doing so requires subtle reasoning about the absence of ABA problems. While these stack examples may seem simple, verifying more sophisticated concurrent programs is still a significant challenge, requiring more sophisticated moves as annotations, supporting program invariants and method specifications. However, we believe Anchor provides an effective platform for doing that, that scales nicely to more and more complex uh, pieces of software. I'm now going to demonstrate some of the debugging features of Anchor for when verification fails. To do that, I'm going to add a new class to a new method to stack that first pushes the value 10 and then asserts that the head's item is equal to 10. And if I try to verify this, I'm going to get an error. And the error indicates that the access to this dot head on line 22 has the error commutivity, that is, I violated the synchronization discipline. We can see why that's the case if I click on the E. It tells me that I've accessed this dot head in a context where I don't hold the lock, hold the lock on the, this object. With that information, I can go back to the program and add a lock acquire and release around that assertion. And I'll try to verify it again. And in this case, I'll get another reduction error, this time caused by the acquire on line 22. If I fold down the nested call to this dot push, I can see that the last a uh, statement performed by push is a release operation that's a left mover, and acquire is a right mover. I can't have a right mover following a left mover and still match our reducibility pattern. What I'll do in this case is add a yield to indicate that we've left one atomic region and are about to enter a second region. In this case, that yield will take care of the reduction error, but I'll end up with a third error that our assertion might not hold. And to diagnose this, I'll look at the counterexample given to me by Anchor, 
which shows me that the local variable temp1 has the value 15, it should be 10. 15 is also the value stored in this dot head dot item. We can go back and see where the uh, change occurred, why we don't see 10 there, by looking at the state of the program at the yield. This shows us both the pre-state and the post-state for yield, and any changes that occur during the yield are highlighted in red. And as we can see, during the yield, another thread changed this dot head from node 0, whose item was 10, to node 10, whose item is 15, leading to the potential assertion problem. We have found that diagnostic information and these counterexamples have been crucial in quickly identifying and fixing concurrency errors in our examples. I'm going to conclude our talk by describing our experience implementing a non-blocking concurrent queue from the LibLFDS library. This queue is designed for use by a single end queuer and a single D queuer. The internal representation is a fixed size array where the end queuer adds elements at tail and the D queuer removes elements at head. If either tail or head go past the end of the array, they just wrap back to the beginning. In order to facilitate our discussion, let me introduce two predicates. Is used is true for any index in that array currently holding a value stored in the queue. That is, it captures the blue boxes here. Is free are those indices that are not currently used to hold a value, the gray boxes. With those definitions, let me explore a couple of the moves as specifications for our Q class, and I'll begin with the LMs array itself. The specification, which we've seen before, indicates that all accesses are both movers as long as the Q object is thread local, but if it's shared, the LMs field is read only. Reads are permitted, but re writes are not. We also include in the declaration of LMs the moves as annotation describing the synchronization discipline for each index in the array. And there are two cases where reads and writes will be both movers. The first is when the end queuing object is performing the access and the index is a free index. The second case is when the dequeuing thread is performing the access and is accessing a used index in the array. Essentially, we've partitioned the array into two disjoint sets of indices and permit each thread to only access one of those two sets. This is the moves as annotation for the tail field. Only the enqueuing thread will ever write to it. So if we do see a read by the enqueuing thread, it's a both mover. There will be no concurrent writes. Otherwise, the read is a non mover, since there could be a concurrent write by the enqueuing thread at the same time. If we see a write, it must be by the enqueuing thread. And also, the value being written into tail must correspond to a free index in the array. That requirement is essential for the correctness argument for the queue, and is readily captured in our synchronization specifications. We chose this queue in part so that we could compare Anchor to Armada, another concurrent verification tool recently published at PLDI. Armada, like Civil, is designed to be very flexible and expressive. One verifies a program in Armada by first writing the implementation, and then providing a series of refinements leading to the abstract specification for the code. In addition to those refinements, one has to prove that each refinement is valid. Uh, those refinements can be reduction steps, abstraction steps, or any other sort of refinement that you embed inside of the Armada uh, framework. The expressiveness of that technique comes at a price, though. The authors of Armada uh, report spending about six person days implementing the queue data structure. It required about 760 lines of implementation, refinement code, and proof sketches. And on our test machine, it requires about 36 minutes to verify that code base. In contrast, we took only about a person day of time in Anchor to implement the queue. The code and the spec together in Anchor is only 62 lines of code, and we can verify that in 13 seconds. So while we can't verify everything that you could verify in a tool like Armada, we believe that we've identified an effective programming language, specification technique, and verification methodology that allows one to readily and more easily 
reason about the correctness of a large group of concurrent algorithms and data structures. We invite you to explore Anchor in more detail and try our prototype at the given address, and we thank you for your attention.